Several freshmen are standing out already in Oklahoma Sooners spring ball. We're going to discuss that and so much more in today's episode of Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to Locked On Sooners, and thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. Today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. My buddy here is Josh Helmer. You can follow him on Twitter at JoshOnRef. The show is at Locked On Sooners. And spring ball is the top story in Oklahoma athletics right now because, hey, we got a lot of turnover that's happening. Got a great recruiting class that's coming in. And several freshmen are already making a little bit of noise in 2024 spring ball for the Oklahoma Sooners guys over at OU Insider and rivals Jesse Crittenden made the interesting note that Reggie Powers is a name to keep in mind at cornerback. He is seeing a ton of reps at corner during seven on seven and scout team drills. He's been on the field a lot, both today and Monday. He hasn't looked out of place at all. He also went on to mention that uh, the defensive staff is trying out a lot of different combinations and kind of in the early part of their team drills, Reggie Powers and Jaden Jackson were out there first for the defense against the offense. So our, our guys, Reggie Powers and Jaden Jackson, two of our favorites from the 2024 signing class, already making a little uh, a, a good impression early on in their careers with Oklahoma. And anytime we talk about somebody playing at corner, young guy, uh, you know, been an in-house guy, everything for me sort of trickles back to Woody Washington moving around for Oklahoma a little bit. So w- when we first started seeing Reggie Powers burst onto the scene of Oklahoma's recruiting radar, the thought was, okay, 6'1", 200 pounds, Ohio native got a chance to may- maybe be a cheetah type for Oklahoma. Maybe he's, uh, you know, there was a lot of recruiting services that thought Reggie Powers was a safety coming out of uh, high school. And again, that's why you kind of say, okay, well, maybe he's a cheetah, maybe he's a safety. Now you tell me he's working out at corner. Well, Again, when Woody Washington, somebody that is shuffling around for Oklahoma and uh, in working out a little bit at Cheetah. And, oh, oh, by the way, you've got a Desan McCullough that was at Cheetah that now is mixing around at linebacker. Somebody's got to take those corner snaps opposite Gentry Williams. And it sounds like to me, Reggie Powers is getting an early look. You know, you know not going to chalk anybody up as a, a, a starter opposite Gentry Williams right now, but kind of the way that the reshuffling of the deck, if you will, is going for Oklahoma defensively. Does Reggie Powers have a chance to step in and make an immediate impact? I wouldn't put it past him. I mean, he's a guy that's an uber athlete. I mean, he kind of blew everybody away with his athletic testing, you know, did more reps on the bench as a 17 year old than Jatavian Sanders, the tight end at Texas, who's what, 21, 22 years old already and been in college football for several years. So I wouldn't put it past the kid to go and, and be an impactful player. Now we don't know exactly which players aren't available due to injury. And so there could be a lot of guys just kind of hanging back right now uh, due to just Nixon, Nixon bruises, from the offseason training program that might be impacting cornerback availability. Uh, but it is intriguing at the very least that he's getting some run over there because he is a very athletic player. He's a physical player too. So that's going to provide uh, a nice little bit of physicality on the outside, kind of like a Gentry Williams who kind of surprised everybody last fall whenever he was coming up and blowing plays up you know, behind the line of scrimmage, all those wide receiver screens, they tried to run his side. He's like, nope, not my side. Try that somewhere else because it's not coming my way. You can have that on the other side with maybe a guy like Reggie Powers, and that's very intriguing. I don't necessarily think he's going to, you know, be, be a starter at corner uh, early on, but I it wouldn't surprise me to see him get rotational snaps uh, for the defense this fall at safety, at cornerback, maybe in some, you know, kind of Kendall Dolby style cheetah snaps where he's just coming off the edge and rushing the passer. So it, it wouldn't surprise me. Now on the Jaden Jackson front, 
if you go follow George Stoya over on Twitter, you'll see some of the the clips and from the one on one drills in practice. And Jaden Jackson, he's holding his own. I mean, he's going up against Troy Everett, who also looked really good in that one on one rep. But Jaden Jackson's strength is already translating to the college football level. And that's not a surprise. If you've been a fan of this show for any length of time, you know my affinity for Jaden Jackson. One, just the nose tackle. I love a pure nose tackle, a guy that's going to be able to get in there and just muck everything up. But because of his quickness and his strength, he's going to be a guy that's going to have some pass rush ability as well. He's going to make life living H-E double hockey sticks for opposing centers all year long, even as a freshman, I think. Even if he's playing as a rotational player behind Dejon Terry, he's still going to make things really, really difficult when he comes in, you know, giving Terry a breather or he comes in on third down, you know, say it's a third and five situation. You're not sure if it's going to be a rush run or pass. Well, hey, you got a guy like Jaden Jackson who can make some things happen as a pass rusher, and that's going to make things a lot more difficult for the offense. You see other notes out there about a guy like David Stone already physically looking the part. And, okay, it's rare. To, to find defensive tackles that come in as true freshmen. And people can say that about that's not an easy thing to do for anybody. Also on the decent defensive tackle note, and I'll let you kind of react to all the things that I'm saying here. Grayson Halton is standing out. And that's a guy that we've talked about several times over the last few weeks that needs to stand out with the Jacob Lacey medical retirement. You've got to have a guy like Jacob Lacey stepping up and showing up and being a dominant three tech for you going into this 2024 season. Yeah, it can't just be two true freshmen in David Stone and Jaden Jackson and Ashton Sanders. I mean, there, there's another name that look uh, needs to make a leap for Oklahoma, right? But that's a that's a young guy too. So, uh, Halton Sanders, uh, Dejon Terry, just being who he was, and then a little bit better. And we'll see if there's not, uh, you know, obviously Philip Bleedy is a name out there that's out of the transfer portal that Oklahoma's offered that uh, is set to visit for the OU spring game. So maybe there's, uh, you know, once the spring's wrapped up, another defensive tackle name to add to the mix. But in terms of where we're at today, yeah, I mean, guys that have been here, we're looking for more out of guys that have played. And probably you need a couple of those other guys that haven't really impacted things yet, John, to, to do just that, to step up and be legitimate impact players for OU. But as it pertains to Stone, as it pertains to Jaden Jackson, I'm not I'm not super shocked to hear this. I mean, this duo I sort of suspected would come in and have a chance to to help Oklahoma straight away and uh, I think together they can help Oklahoma because they play well off of one another and they're incredibly familiar with one another. So that uh, that's obviously going to go a long way. Another note that I'd like to touch on in the next couple of days, I think it's interesting that uh, Dion Burks is seriously working as a punt returner for Oklahoma. I know that Gavin Freeman's nicked up, and so you have to kind of take that into consideration as well. But I'm kind of down for Dion Burks and Peyton Bowen and maybe some other guys that are suspected to be legitimate key cogs for you offensively, defensively in the way of Deion Burks and of Peyton Bowen. I like the idea of trying to be special in the special teams department, but yeah, man, there's a lot going on in the way of uh, spring practice notes. We could spend probably hours talking about some of the stuff that's come out from spring ball. Yeah. Deion Burks looks like he's going to be one of those guys that everybody's going to fall in love with. We're going to get for one year and then he's going to be off to the NFL in 2025 because he's, he's going to be so dynamic with the ball in his hands. And, and they're going to look for a lot of ways to get the ball in his hands out of the slot as a receiver, as a runner, and then in the punt return game as well. They've got to find a way to be dynamic in the punt return game because you cannot just not have anything happening as a punt returner. So we'll see how the competition plays out over the rest of the spring throughout camp. I mean, there's so many intriguing camp battles happening right now, uh, but we're going to continue to talk about Oklahoma's defense because, hey, there's a lot that's going to change in 2024 with all of the realignment that's happening. Oklahoma going into the SEC, you need your defense that's going to be very, very experienced to step up and be a difference maker. Can they define the season for the 2024 Oklahoma Sooners? We'll talk about that next coming up here on Locked On Sooners. 
This week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest. Just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. The North Carolina Tar Heels can only be described as an armada. This is this one seed is as hardcore as it gets out there, so it's no wonder they secured a spot in the Sweet 16 this Thursday against Alabama in the NCAA Tournament. They're a favorite picked by many to make a run for the national title. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Bracket uh, already busted. Tired of that same old daily fantasy grind where you make your roster, you cross your fingers, and you just hope for the best, or you're losing out on that last leg of your pick em entry. Well, introducing better together the first cooperative daily fantasy platform where teamwork triumphs talent and you can play with your friends not against them you can pick more or less on real-time player stats strategize with your partner to boost your odds and climb that leaderboard together so grab a friend and join the social dfs movement download better together now from the app store and sign up using promo code locked on for a chance to win your share of over one thousand dollars in cash prizes remember the code locked on because winning alone is fun but it's better together are you watching fox sports or espn on your tv all day have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news. Streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So, Josh, I found it interesting. ESPN was asking the question, there were 12 teams that they believed would define the 2024 college football season, and they didn't include the Oklahoma Sooners. Now, I didn't read the entire article to, to hash out the rationale. They included teams like Ohio State, who had a great defense in 2023, a team like USC, who didn't have a great defense in 2023, but obviously if they have a better defense that could change things for the Trojans. But for the Oklahoma Sooners, there's so much turnover that's happened on the offensive side of the football, quarterback, the offensive line, tight end, areas where you have to be really, really good. But if you're not A plus in those areas, you got to have to pick it up. And the defense is going to be the, the unit that has the experience to maybe balance out where Oklahoma is a little bit more inexperienced. So I ask you the question, can Oklahoma's defense, and it's been probably a long time since anybody that covers Oklahoma has asked this question, can they define who the Sooners are in 2024? I hope so. I uh, feel as though I've been banging on this drum for a little while now that there's this bright and shiny thing, and it's look over here, look over here, Jackson Arnold. He's the biggest key to Oklahoma's 2024 season, and I've sort of slammed on the, the brakes of the Sooner Schooner and said, wait a tick here. Now, I was sold that Britt Vittables was coming over from Clemson, where he's the defensive mastermind, the best defensive coordinator in all of college football because, well, that's who Brent Vittables was and has been. And I was sold this idea that by year two, by year three, man, this Oklahoma defense, it was going to be back to elite. And you know what? Along the way, uh, credit given where credit's due, Oklahoma has recruited much better defensively top to bottom. Now, there are some that would say, yeah, but it took until that third cycle for them to find David Stone, to find Jaden Jackson. And I hear you there. I see that. And that might be a fair uh, argument to be made. But everywhere else, Oklahoma's hit on prospects like they really hadn't hit on in the decade prior. So all I say is, can OU's defense define the 2024 season? Yes, it can. Yes, it should. The time is now for Oklahoma to turn the defensive corner for all of the items that I just listed, John. And then on top of that, the fact that, okay, well, you've got those big decisions coming back to OU. Uh, Woody Washington returns. Billy Bowman returns. Danny Stutzman returns. Uh, Ethan Downs is back. I mean, there's a lot of experience back on this OU defense. Peyton Bowen is uh, the young five-star defensive back that now he's a year older, wiser. So there's a lot of reasons for 
yes, it should be this season where we see not, okay, I hope OU's a top 40 defense. They should be one of the best defenses in the SEC this season, John, if this thing is going where we all hope it's going. And I don't think that's unrealistic to hope for or to expect. No, after the jump that they made last year, I don't think it's unreasonable, especially with the guys coming back that you mentioned, including a guy like Dejon Terry, and for the development of your young roster. You've got a lot of blue chip players on this team that really haven't contributed just yet because either they were freshmen or you know the, there was a bit of a log jam in front of them. You know, I look at a guy like Grayson Halton, who we touched on in the first segment. I mean, there was a bit of a log jam at defensive tackle. And he's still kind of getting his weight up, getting that strength and conditioning thing going. He's entering now his third offseason with the Sooners. There's a good chance that he has that breakout season. We saw flashes from him last spring. At the time, they kind of mentioned that it was about just about consistency for him. Well, at this point, he should pretty much have it figured out how to be a consistent football player down in, down out. And he's making a little bit of noise so far in spring ball. If he can be that that three-tech defensive tackle that helps re- you rush the passer, that should help your defense because you haven't really gotten much pass rush out of your defensive tackles for the first couple of years of Brent Venable's tenure with the Sooners. You got guys like Adipoja Adabari. You mentioned Peyton Bowen. Well, P.J., that's a dude that if he steps up and steps into a significant role this year, I think it's going to help Oklahoma's pass rush as well. If R. Mason Thomas can stay healthy through the offseason, that's going to give you a lot of burst off the edge. And then the linebacker core is just ridiculous. It really is. You've got Danny Stutzman. you got Desan McCullough. I mean, let's not sleep on Jerry Canick. Let's not do that, please. Because, yeah, it was up and down for him in his first year as a starter. But the guy is such an athlete, and he's working with – Brent Venables and Zach Alley and James Skalski and Danny Stutzman. He's learning from all these guys. He's going to get better guys like yes, up and down. It wasn't great at times. He, he hurt you a couple times, but the dude is so athletic and he's so fast and he's so physical. If you give it time, he could actually end up being a great player for Oklahoma. Same with Kip Lewis. And yes, he had some great snaps early in the season as a rotational player, but when he became a starter like Canick, it was a bit of an up and down roller coaster for him, but development happens. He's still got the instincts. He's still got the athleticism and the speed to be fantastic. So that linebacker crew is going to be great this year. Not just good. I think it's going to be great because you're going to get development from these guys. Now that they've got some experience under their belt, they can figure it out a little bit more and they can go into their you know third season with the Sooners in Brent Venables defense with some experience and playing time now. And then that secondary, it's young, you know, beyond Woody Washington and and Billy Bowman, it's pretty young. You're going to be relying on Peyton Bowen. You're going to be relying on Gentry Williams and some of these other corners like Makari Vickers and Jacoby Johnson. But also you got a guy like Robert Spears Jennings, who's in his third year now with Brenton Venables. And he's an ascending player in his own right. He, He had a you know, a little bit of a run in 2022, got a bigger expanded role last year. And when he was out there on the field, he flashed. That speed and that physicality, it showed up on film. So it's all kind of coming together. And and you hear people talk about 2025 being the year that Oklahoma should contend. But why not? Why not now? You've got all Americans on your defense and Danny Stutzman and Billy Bowman that are going to be able to lead this thing. You've got young ascending players that are just now coming into their own. This could be a year where all that comes together and Oklahoma's defense is an elite unit, Josh. Yeah, it's uh, if things come together defensively, the time is now the maybe counter argument some would make is, well, the offensive timeline doesn't really match up with the defensive timeline. Now, all of a sudden, because you're breaking in Jackson Arnold at quarterback and because of what's going on with the offensive line. But if the defense turns the corner and becomes an elite unit or right on the fringe of elite, well then, okay, because of the setup of college football now, We talked about this the other day. You can drop a game or two and play your best football late. So I think about Oklahoma's offensive line. I think about Jackson Arnold at quarterback. If you can find a way to squeeze the best out of Jackson Arnold in the final third of the season and beyond, and oh, by the way, not cough up too many opportunities beforehand and put yourself into that 12-team playoff, the setup of college football now is different 
to where remember however many years ago back it was when uh, you know a couple of times it happened for OU late in late in the season I think it's Spencer Rattler's first year starting that people were kind of having the conversation of well look at the way this OU team's playing now it may be that team right at, at the end of the year uh but USC several years before that I don't remember who the starting quarterback was but maybe it was or, Darnold or even the year that Oklahoma lost to Ohio State in, in Houston you know, that year with sure. Baker Mayfield, you know, they were a great team that year that would have made a lot of noise in that college football playoff. But it took until the end of the season for, yeah, things to come together. But this opens up that door of possibility so long as you don't stub your toe one too many times early. So anyways, that's a long ways to get to the point of if Oklahoma, de if Oklahoma's defense is much improved, then they're going to have a chance to do some of those things. Yeah, and, and it's a talented team on both sides of the football. And, I mean, Jackson Arnold's a great player, but this is going to be his first year as a starter. And going into some of these SEC environments is not for the faint of heart. We're going to find out a lot about his mental makeup uh, throughout the 2024 season, uh, especially that that first road trip that Oklahoma makes as well. So, uh, But, hey, college football is changing. It's evolving. Transfer portal, NIL, the college football playoff. Former Oklahoma Sooners head coach, coach of the Arlington uh, – Roughnecks? Am I saying that right? Renegades. Renegades. Roughnecks is a MLL lacrosse team. Um, he believes that college football might need a commissioner. And I think he's absolutely right. We'll talk about that next coming up here on Locked On Sooners. Fire TV, it's your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in Depth analysis Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as, of course, the Fire TV stick that you can just plug right in to your existing TV, and that provides access to millions of movies, TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. And with all the sports going on right now, yeah, you're going to want to have Fire TV. Plus, hey, Fire TV recently created their Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands. All for free. And oh, by the way, that includes all of us right here at Locked On. Most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels lets you dive into all of the game analysis, highlights, and more. All of that good stuff you're seeking to keep up to date on the latest in the world of sports. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and on Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should trust us on this. To learn more, visit www. Amazon.com backslash locked on fire TV. College football has evolved to a point that it doesn't look a lot like what we are used to. 20 years ago, the game was very different. We didn't have a 12 team playoff. We didn't have NIL. The transfer portal wasn't a thing. You could transfer, but you still had to sit out a little bit. Well, Bob Stoops, Oklahoma legend, uh, college football hall of famer, one of the clear voices on college football had this to say about the state of college football and why it might need a commissioner. He said, it's a pro model right now with college football. It's a pro model. So the NCAA isn't govern governing it. We need to have a commissioner. We got to have salary caps on what you can spend. You got to have contracts on and on. I don't see how you cannot, if it's going to continue this way, it goes on to say, it's not very good. I don't think it's very good for anybody. Is it sustainable? In my eyes, it's not. I mean, as much as I've been a proponent for players being able to transfer, like coaches can just kind of up and go where they want to go when they want to go. I haven't been bothered by the transfer portal situation. Transfer portal combined with what NIL is doing, it kind of creates a, a bit of a black hole in college fo football where just so much gravity and so much focus is spent on portal and NIL that it kind of takes away a little bit from the beauty of the game. If you had one of one or two of those things separated, then it might work a little bit better. But the two combined is a to me, it's a net negative for college football. I don't know how you can create a salary cap, but I do think that there is a future in which contracts, whether it's scholarship contracts or the NIL contracts being more binding might be in, in college football's future. It would be fascinating if somebody in, I don't even know if this is conceivable to do, but it would be fascinating to see someone try to put together or a university publicized the data of how 
spending is going in as it pertains to three different uh, trees, the tree of ticket purchasing, the tree of just general donations. Some of that obviously enveloped into the ticket uh, season ticket purchasing or just individual game purchases. And then the, the third of course, being the funding of NIL collectives has the NIL collective affected the other two at all. And, uh, and if so, then what does that mean for the other two? And if not, does that just tell us that the collective funding from fans really just comes from a very specific set of fans that are such diehard fans that they're going to donate, they're going to buy tickets and Oh, by the way, they're going to fund NIL too. But you know, I'd love to see something, anything that could share some of that data in a sensible manner to, sort of makes sense uh, of all of it. Having said that, I don't think fans should have that on their plate. And I hope that we get to a point to where what Bob Stoops, some of what he said is right to where, you know, you do have collectively bargained contracts to some degree or OU or Alabama or the Big Ten or the SEC is involved in the payment of players. And you and I and others aren't necessarily as involved in uh, the name image likeness side. I'm all for players earning. I, I think I've been pretty clear, uh, a pretty uh, outspoken proponent of players deserve to get paid what players have earned. But I also don't necessarily like picking the pockets of hardworking fans uh, that, you know, if that does affect the ticket purchasing side, I think that's a sad, sad side effect of where we've gotten in college sports. So, Hey, you know, look, I, I want players to earn. I, that's not going away. That's going to grow. I think in the future, but I can see a situation to where what Bob Stoops is calling for, where somebody's sort of in charge of making a bunch of these big time decisions, John and the sec and the big 10, they fall in line. And Oh, by the way, the TV contracts that's involved in paying some of these players. So where are we going to be at five years from now? I have no idea. It's it's crazy. It'll have some of all of that, but what will it totally look like? I don't know. Yeah, it, and it's going to be hard, I think, to come to an agreement on, okay, who is that college football commissioner that's going to help manage and, and negotiate all of that? Because you got to pay that person a salary. If it's not going to be the NCAA, then where's it going to come from? I, I do think that there is a reasonable way to get to that, but at some point the conferences have to quit eating each other a little bit to, so that they can come together and come to some kind of collective agreement on what a salary cap looks like or a spending floor looks like, because I mean, that's part of it in professional sports. Not only do you have a cap or a luxury tax, but you also have that spending floor too. Are they going to create that? I don't see how they can hold universities to that, but there, there, there is going to come a point where something has to shift. Even if you don't create a salary cap, then you have to be able to hold players a little bit more accountable to their contracts and coaches. In my opinion, I think you got to start. You also got to do it with coaches because if you're going to ask the players to live up to their agreements and there's either just their scholarship or their NIL agreements, then we have to ask these coaches to live up to their agreements unless they are legitimately getting a promotion, uh, just like the NFL does. Like the NFL doesn't let coaches just go, you know, lateral, take lateral jobs. You know, you can't be the wide receivers coach in Dallas and then go be the wide receivers coach for the Philadelphia Eagles. That just doesn't happen. You've got to be getting a promotion somehow, um, unless obviously your contract is up. The same should be said for college football as well. Too many times you're seeing guys go from running backs coach at one spot to running back coach at another spot, and there's not really a promotion. Yeah, they're getting a pay bump to do it, but it's it's not really a change in their job status. Well, that part needs to change as well because that part, like again, college football programs just continue to just eat each other and galvanize each other for players and coaches and all that stuff. It's hard to to ask anybody to live up to your word and your agreement when you see the people at the top doing it. And, and the same for, I mean, athletic directors, you saw Texas A&M go and poach Nebraska's athletic director and Nebraska went and took Washington's and Washington took Washington States. Uh, Arizona took Missouri's like, it's just everybody in college football. It's like, there's no, um, 
all's fair in love and war in college football. Apparently like you don't worry about making somebody else mad. You just go and take what you want and be damned everybody else. But uh, there's going to have to be some structure that's put in place. And I, and I know, again, I've, I've proposed NIL transfer portal, all that, but we got to come to some structure and some accountability that I even hate to say, like creates accountability for the kids. It creates accountability for everybody that everybody is accountable to each other. And there's a level of structure to this so that it's not just this wild west. It's not just this shootout every off season where it's, it's thousands of kids going into the portal and it's a free for all to get those kids to come to your school. Do you see a salary cap at any point coming to that? That's hard for me to wrap my mind around And the reason I say that is not because it's illogical or that it wouldn't, I mean, it makes sense for a lot of reasons, right? But college sports are not about being equitable. It's Mm -mm. always been about being totally unequal, right? There's blue bloods. There's reasons you have this phrase blue blood in college basketball in college football, because Those programs are historic haves and the others are have nots. And I don't see the haves trying to sign a sheet of paper that says, oh, yes, we'd like to help the have nots. And in the process, let's make it more difficult for ourselves going forward. So I don't know that part of it. I don't know that we're ever getting a quote unquote salary cap. I could see some form or fashion of a revenue share. So when I say collectively bargained in the big 10 and the sec pays players in the big 12 does or whoever, or whatever, I think that happens, but I don't see the big 10, and the sec sharing their money with the big 10 or the sec or the big 12 or the ACC. I don't see this big conglomerate. I think uh, probably the sec wants to keep earning for the sec and Oklahoma wants to keep earning for Oklahoma. And, uh, you know, there is a capitalistic nature to a lot of this. So I don't see that changing and I don't see a salary cap coming into play. I could see some form of every school has to, uh, you know, spend a set amount of NIL dollars or whatever you want to say. Right. Or relative to whatever conference you're a part of, a part of the TV revenue that you earn has to go to players. But the idea that everybody's going to get the same amount to spend, I don't see that happening. No, there's no way. Like Greg Sankey doesn't care about the Sun Belt. He doesn't care about the AAC. He's not making decisions based on what's going to be good for the other nine conferences in the uh, FBS. I I do think that there could come a point where you see a power four breakaway and that's its own national league. And then the, the group of six that becomes its own national league and the group of six has their own national championship and the power four has their own national championship. And, and it creates a little bit more of a divide uh, where, okay, you know, the teams like, I don't know, look at North Texas, university of North Texas. It's they're not playing the same level of college football that George is playing. They're just not. Uh, and you could say the same thing about 60 other schools in, in college football. And maybe you see a little bit more of a break uh, from the, the power four from that group of six and it, and it creates a different sport altogether, but I don't see a salary cap because I don't know how you're going to, you're going to tell the sec and the big 10 that you can only spend X amount of dollars so that the AAC and the Sun Belt and the mountain West can have a competitive advantage. That's well, just not going to happen. It's not, but I do think that Bob soups is right. And there needs to be a commissioner involved at some point down the road. No doubt. Somebody that can be a a hard line decision maker in some form or fashion. Yes, will be needed. Think about this, though, in closing here. It's not even the Big Ten telling the SEC we're not going to, you know, spend the same as you. It's the Big Ten telling Michigan, telling Ohio State, telling Penn State, telling Rutgers that, hey, Ohio State, you have to only spend the same as Rutgers. (laughs) That ain't going to happen. Right. Exactly. And so there's no salary cap coming. They're just going to try to still make as much money as possible. And this is just college football. It's just evolving and there'll be maybe a little bit more structure and and more answers down the road, but hopefully Bob Stoops will be the next commissioner of the college football playoff era. And he can help navigate us all through 
these rough waters to smoother seas. And that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Sooners. Thanks for tuning in and being a part of the show. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. We're free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube. So hit that notification bell to let you know when new episodes drop. Follow Josh on X at Josh on Ref, myself at John Nine Williams. But until next time, he's Josh. I'm John Boomer Sooner.